So in this chapter, we're going to learn about composite materials. What are the classes and types of composites? What are the advantages of using composite materials? And how do we predict stiffness and strength of various types of composites? So modern technologies require unusual combinations of the conventional materials and the question is why? So because increasing the strength or stiffness of a material will decrease its impact strength. So even if we try to increase the strength of a material with different strengthening techniques, we are actually decreasing impact strength of it. So it is not possible to achieve uh, strength, most, in most cases, the strength and increasing the impact strength at the same time. And also, we know that strong materials are relatively dense, like metals. Um, they are strong, but they are also dense. We want something strong and lightweight. Therefore, this Modern technologies therefore require this uh, combination of different materials to achieve um, desired properties. So if we actually combine two or more materials or phases, we get a better combination of properties like low density and high strength. So the idea here is to engineer materials to maximize properties of both materials. So examples are like aerospace uh, applications like uh, structural components, automotive parts, sinks, bathtubs, swimming pools, buildings, bridges, snowboards, golf clubs, finishing pole, fishing poles. So most of the uh, transportation industry and um, aerospace, I mean, and uh, sports goods, these are now currently made of uh, composite materials. So when we say composite, we are to talking about artificially made Composite. So by intentionally, people are mixing two different types of phase or two different types of materials. So the terminology here is we have a matrix which is continuous and it is shown in the image, right? Matrix can be a metal, polymer, ceramic. Within that matrix, we also have a dispersed phase, okay? So in the dispersed phase, it is discontinuous, like fibers and particles. This distinct discontinuous phase is surrounded by the matrix. So this terminology now important, you guys need to put this image in your mind. Whether, whenever we say matrix, what does it mean, or if we say the dispersed phase or the fibers, what do we mean, okay? So, uh, so this is the terminology to start with. The composites might be achieved at the macro, micro or nano length scales. So you can mix two different materials phases at different uh, length scales like a macro scale example is like a steel reinforced concrete or micro scale is like carbon glass fiber reinforced plastics at nano scale you can say precipitation strength in alloys like nano composites We can give some examples to composites, like space shuttle tiles consist of silica fibers and air at the same time, and this exhibit uh, low thermal conductivity. 
or epoxies may be filled with silver to increase thermal conductivity because epoxies are not conductive thermally conductive but silver is so if we add silver to epoxy we are actually increasing the thermal conductivity or we can uh, do zirconia coating on turbine blade uh, to provide protection against high temperatures so making a coating on top of another material as you can imagine it is also a composite material because we you are using the properties of two different materials now we have said there are two phases in composite matrix which was continuous and then dispersed phase which was discontinuous and surrounded by the matrix so what is the purpo purpose of the matrix and what is the purpose of the dispersed phase now the first purpose of the matrix is to transfer the stress to dispersed phase see we don't want the matrix to handle the stresses because usually the matrix uh, is not stronger uh, I mean compared to the fiber fibers are the strongest phase so that's why what you want is not the matrix handle the stresses but you want matrix to transfer this stress to the dispersed phase so the dispersed phase fibers for example then can handle these stresses because they are stronger Another purpose of the matrix is to basically pro protect this dispersed phase from environment. So tiny particles or fibers, these are the dispersed phase. And we don't want them to uh, corrode or any type of damage to happen to them. And the matrix prevents that type of damage and protects them. So it transfers the stress and it also protects the dispersed phase from the uh, environment. It actually holds the fibers together and protect the fibers from any surface damage. There can be abrasion, chemicals, and it is also separating the fi fibers. This also prevent crack propagation that can happen from one fiber to another. But the matrix phase determines the maximum service temperature. So there are types MMC, CMC, PMC. Here it may it mean it stands for metal matrix composites ceramics matrix composites or polymer matrix composite it depends on the type of the uh, matrix material is it a metal your mat matrix is a metal ceramic or a polymer depending on that the uh, name of the composite will change and then the dispersed phase so dispersed phase is uh, can be particles, can be fibers, or structural. Like you are seeing in the images, some type of fibers are given to us. Um, like, uh, for example, woven fibers. It doesn't have to be individual fibers, okay? They can be in the form of woven fibers. Or there you also see the cross-section view of the same thing and you can see how they are um, woven to each other so they can be in any form the fiber phase the dispersed phase they can be not it doesn't have to be fibers they can be particles fiber structural means like laminates or sandwich panels and when we say particle reinforced, it can be large and 
particles or dispersion strengthen and fiber reinforced can be discontinuous or continuous there are different type of versions available so the properties of composite will depend on uh, the properties of these uh, dispersed phase okay and then the properties of the matrix phase so it will also depend on relative amount of phases so how much of each you have it also depends on the geometry of the dispersed phase what is its size what is its shape what is the distribution and orientation and it also depends on the properties also depends on the bonding strength between the dispersed phase and the matrix because they need to hold each other strongly otherwise we cannot transfer the stress from the matrix to the fiber to the dispersed phase if we look at the purpose of dispersed phase in general it will depend on what type of composite you have when you have metal matrix composite the dispersed phase the idea of putting a dispersed phase inside the metal metal matrix is to increase the yield strength tensile strength and creep resistance for ceramic mat mat matrix composites matrix composite remember ceramics are brittle they have low fracture toughness so the idea of making ceramics into a composite is to actually increase their fracture toughness k1c so for polymers polymer matrix composites you remember polymers they have low elastic modulus low strength and when we actually add a dispersed phase to polymers and make polymer matrix composites, the idea here is to increase the stiffness, yield strength, tensile strength, and creep resistance. So here we are summarizing what we have learned so far. We have composites and we have different types. Like it can be particle reinforced, fiber reinforced, or structural or nano. So particle reinforced is it can be large particle or dispersion strengthened, very tiny sizes like nano sizes. Or fiber reinforced, these are can be continuous uh, aligned fibers or discontinuous short fibers. And the discontinuous short fibers can be aligned or they can be randomly oriented. So all these will affect the properties at the end. Remember, the dispersed phase, this orientation and distribution affects the properties. And structural laminates and sandwich panels and there is nanocomposites. Now, if we take a look at particle reinforced composites, uh, these are multi-phase materials like pearlitic steel, like where the alpha is uh, soft and ductile, there is cementite which is hard and brittle, and perlite makes a high, good, high ductility and strength due to the presence of both cementite as a hard and brittle cementite and soft and ductile ferrite. So similar to that, we have examples, for example, cephalodite steel. The alpha matrix is ferrite, ductile, and there is cementite particles that is brittle. Again, this provides ductility and uh, hardness at the same time. So strength and ductility at the same time, as you can see. Or there is the um, uh, particle, another, uh, another uh, e example to... Uh, the particle reinforced composites these are tungsten carbide uh, particles in a cobalt matrix and you guys are also seeing the microscopic images right they, they are identifying which are one are, are the particles what which one is the matrix itself so in this case the matrix is uh, cobalt 
which is ductile and tough but the tungsten carbide is a ceramic we know it is hard and brittle so you achieve strength and ductility at the same time and there is another example automobile uh, tire rubber the matrix is rubber and the particles are carbon black so remember rubber is actually whitish right so you have you ever questioned that why actually car tires even if they are made up of um, rubber why they are black so the fact is the, the reason they are black is because uh, there is carbon black is added as a reinforcing filler in rubber products especially tires so there are some fillers uh, added to the polymeric materials and an example of this is carbon black being added to the rubber so this is done in order to improve tensile and compressive strength toughness and thermal stability of polymers in this case rubber In particle reinforced, uh, large particle reinforced, uh, or so, what was it, uh, dispersion strengthening. So in particle reinforced polymers, the particulate phase usually harder and stiffer. And particles restrain the movement of the matrix phase in the vicinity of each particle. Matrix transfers applied stress to the particle so the degree of improvement of properties will depend on the bonding strength at the matrix and particle interface the idea here is particles uh, approximately the same dimensions in all directions will give you a uniform achievement of uh, enhancement in properties they should be small and evenly distributed for effective reinforcement. Another example to this can be given for aluminum alloys for automotive connecting rods and pistons. They are being strengthened and hardened by addition of silicon carbide particles. Silicon carbide being the hard phase, stiffer phase, which is added to the aluminum. To, uh, to basically strengthen the material so we can use them in connecting rods and pistons other example is concrete which is a composed of cement the matrix and sand and gravel particles so matrix and dispersed phases are ceramic here and there is reinforced concrete the strength of the uh, concrete may be increased by additional uh, reinforcement this is usually accomplished by means of steel rods wires bars or mesh which are embedded into the fresh and uncured concrete so the reinforcement then gives the hardened structure uh, to support greater tensile compressive and shear stresses even if there is a crack it can develop in concrete we know ceramic material concrete so even if it can develop uh, i mean the composite but made up of ceramic materials here if there's a crack develops uh, considerable reinforcement is maintained when we reinforce the concrete with uh, steel bars another reinforcement technique for strengthening concrete involves the introduction of residual compressive stresses into the structural member this, uh, this is called press stress concrete and remember the materials are not good in tension right ceramic materials so if you actually put compressive stresses initially if you press stress the concrete it will con counter interact with the tension 
so this way you increase the tensile strength of the ceramics so this method is uh, used for brittle ceramics uh, they are stronger in compression than in tension and then For this uh, fracture of this stressed concrete member to happen, the magnitude of uh, the precompressive stress must be exceeded by an applied tensile stress. So that is the whole idea. Post tensioning is another way to uh, form. Um, reinforced concrete here actually you can understand this think about you have a rubber band and a series of wooden blocks with holes drilled through them and um, and into which a rubber band is threaded and if you hold the ends of the rubber band the blocks will sag but if you actually tighten the rubber band, right, and the blocks will remain straight. So that is the idea behind this. Okay. So tightening uh, the steel rod uh, and so that it will hold the concrete in place under compression. Now let's look at the dependence of elastic modulus on the volume fraction of the constituent phases uh, for a two-phase composites. So here uh, there is a rule, a rule of mixture. This rule of mixture accurately provides a theoretical upper and lower, lower bound on the properties such as elastic modulus, density, ultimate tensile strength, thermal conductivity, and electrical conductivity. So remember, we are mixing two different materials. And the question is, how are you going to calculate its modulus? Or how are you going to calculate its density? How are you going to calculate its tensile strength? Or how are you going to calculate its thermal conductivity? Usually the best way is to do experiment and get the result. But those experiments or uh, the data which you're seeing here as the black dots, which is collected from experiment, okay, those experimental data for in this case the y axis is modulus and the x axis is percentage of tungsten added to copper. You see the actual data, experimental data is in between limits. Limits, lower limit and upper limit. And upper limit is shown with the uh, red and lower limit is shown with the blue. This upper and lower limit, these are calculated theoretically with an equation. And rule of mixture equation, it provides us the upper bound and lower bound that we should expect by mixing those materials. It doesn't give us the exact. The exact solution can only be done with the experimentation and collecting data points like we are seeing in the black dots. Anyhow, those black dots need to be located somewhere in between these limits. In this case, the modulus of the composite shown with EC they will depend on, in the upper bound, the volume fractions of the each uh, constituent. So, volume fraction of the matrix times modulus of the matrix plus volume fraction of the particle times elastic modulus of the particle this equation forms the upper limit shown with the red the lower limit is through this equation okay so 1 over EC which is the composite uh, modulus is 
volume fraction of the matrix over the modulus of the matrix uh, plus volume fraction of the particle over the modulus of the particle so to, this is to find the lower limit I will not go into derivations of these uh, equations uh, there are reasons why these equations are derived this way uh, you, if you're interested guys you can uh, look for it online and you can see how they actually derived it but it is in not in the scope of this class okay just like the modulus you can apply this technique to any other property like electrical conductivity or thermal conductivity so instead of the modulus you replace them with the electrical conductivity and instead of modulus you can replace the equations with k which is the thermal conductivity at the end idea is the same those are theoretical limits uh, extremes max and mins that the data points can have but actual results are from experiments you collect data from experiments here before going into fibers a fiber reinforced uh, polymer, fiber reinforced composites. Remember, we also have dispersion strength then here. What does that mean? That means we have particles that are very small, like oxides in a structure. Like this particle size is 10 to 100 nanometer. Strengthening in this case occur at atomic or molecular level. And strengthening mechanism in dispersion strengthen materials is similar to precipitation hardening, which will impede the dislocation motion. Since the dislocation motion is impeded, that uh, the plastic deformation is restricted, therefore the yield strength and tensile strength and hardness improve. The good thing actually for uh, dispersion strengthening is unlike precipitation hardening we employed for aluminum alloys strengthening can be retained at elevated temperatures because remember in precipitation hardening we are using the alloying system to form precipitates itself from the phase diagram but in this case we are intentionally dispersing uh, particles ourselves, tiny particles ourselves, which will retain their strength at elevated temperatures. One example to this is theoria, theoria dispersed metals. Theoria dispersed metals, like TD, TD chrome, D, TD nickel. Uh, these are high temperature structural materials that are being used in like gas turbine engines and in your book it should there should be an image and there should be also a table if you're interested to see the applications of different dispersion strengthened composites some examples in my mind is like silver mixed with cadmium oxide used for electrical contact materials, aluminum mixed with alumina, possible use in nuclear reactors, uh, beryllium mixed with beryllium oxide uh, particles. These are aerospace and nuclear application, nuclear reactor applications, etc. So the idea here is tiny, small oxide. Uh, this uh, strong particles being dispersed in the metal matrix here okay that's the whole idea it's similar to the precipitation hardening but in this case uh, you manually add these you are not using the alloying system itself to form the precipitates you are manually adding uh, intentionally adding uh, those particles to achieve strengthening and therefore it retains its uh, strength at elevated temperatures so now we can go to fiber reinforced uh, polymer composites I'm sorry so fibers fiber reinforced fibers they are very uh, strong in tension 
therefore they provide strength to the composite. One example is fiberglass, uh, continuous glass filament in a polymer matrix composite. So we call this fiberglass or glass fiber polymer matrix composite materials. In this case, the glass fiber is the discontinuous phase, which is strong and stiff, and the matrix is polymer. What it does is holds the fiber in place, as we talked about, and protects the fiber surfaces, and then transfers load to the fibers, because the fibers are the stronger phase. They will carry the uh, stresses instead of the matrix. That's the whole point here. Make the matrix transfer the load to the fiber so that it can handle the stresses up to its limit, right? There are different types of fiber types, the fiber phase. First of all, think about the small diameter of a material is much stronger than the bulk form. So if you make any material in the fiber form, it will be stronger than its bulk form. The reason is the uh, possibility of finding defects is decreasing. It's, they are becoming like nearly defect free. So remember, defects are the reasons where there is stress concentrations and therefore failure of material happens. Therefore, as we, uh, small, as we make the sizes smaller, the possibility of finding defects in the structure is lowering down, and this is strengthening the materials compared to their bulk form. So any type of fiber can be uh, created from any type of material, but they will be stronger than their bulk form. And the types here, whiskers, fibers and wires. So whiskers are very thin single crystals that have large aspect ratios. Aspect ratio means length over diameter. And among the strongest uh, known materials due to no mobile uh, dislocations, the whiskers are. And examples are graphite, silicon carbide, silicon nitride, aluminum oxide. They are all possible in whiskers form. Also fibers. Fibers are uh, like polycryst can be polycrystalline or can be amorphous. And these can be generally polymers or ceramics like alumina, aramid fiber like Kevlar, e-glass. Different type of glass fibers are available. One of them is e-glass and boron and Ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. And the wires. The wires are like relatively large diameters, like steel wires, or molybdenum wires, or tungsten wires. So, again, um, the idea here in fiber reinforced composites we have strong, stiff, but brittle fibers in a ductile matrix. It improves the strength and modulus and fatigue resistance. And the key here is, of course, when we reinforce the matrix, the composite itself will have a modulus that is higher than those of their matrices. And um, properties like modulus of composites can be very anisotropic meaning that the modulus is higher in some directions than the others. This is sometimes desired. They intentionally increase the modulus in certain directions. Like when you are using composites to build vaulting pole to achieve stiffness only on certain bending direction or rack rackets, etc. This is intentionally uh, can be done. So what do we mean the properties depends on the direction, like why is it anisotropic? And it is because of the fiber alignment in the structure in, uh, through the matrix. First of all, um, continuous fibers uh, can be aligned and continuous like this one. 
and there are uh, discontinuous uh, fibers that are aligned like this one which are shorter and aligned and there are discontinuous and random distributed fibers like this one all of them will have different properties but better overall properties are realized when the fiber distribution is uniform so as I said the properties of a composite uh, having its fibers aligned are highly and isotropic and depend on the direction which they are measured if you see the enhancement in properties in this case will be achieved in longitudinal direction but in transverse direction you won't observe any significant enhancement in the properties so in this case and in this case as you see the fibers are aligned therefore the properties will depend on the direction and it's going to be anisotropic However, if you have random distribution just like this one, then you achieve enhancement in all directions. So as you see how the fiber orientation can influence the properties. Alright, so we have uh, examples here. Um, we are seeing... Uh, um, example if the matrix is metal or if the matrix is ceramic uh, what are some examples to this it is nickel aluminide uh, in molybdenum matrix as you see molybdenum is the ductile phase the metal and nickel aluminide is the uh, basically the ceramic brittle phase and we are seeing a microscopic image of the fibers that are getting out of the uh, matrix phase we are seeing that it must be an image from the edge of the sample so here in the ceramic um, matrix uh, which is a uh, reinforced with silicon carbide fibers uh, as you see some image is given here the silicon carbide has a better modulus than the glass itself so it is to enhance the modulus of the glass phase, basically. We continue with examples, uh, discontinuous fibers. That means uh, they are randomly uh, and random in two dimensions, meaning randomly distributed. Uh, it can be also aligned, okay? So we have seen that. So here an example is given to us carbon-carbon uh, fiber reinforced composites. All right, the image is here. Carbon fibers we are seeing very stiff and strong within the carbon matrix, which is less stiff and strong. Remember, the carbon can have different structures, right? So, and the fiber form will always be stronger than the matrix itself. So, here how it is done. Uh, carbon fibers, fibers embedded in the polymer resin matrix. And this polymer is pyrolyzed, meaning it uh, turned into carbon. So, at high temperatures, it decomposed and formed carbon inside the structure. So this forms how this shows you how the carbon carbon composites can be done. And I also suggest you guys watch the videos I sent you if you're interested how the carbon fibers are formed, etc. And use of carbon 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 composites in uh, F1 formula cars, F1 cars. Um, so you can watch those videos, but this type of structure, I should say, it is very, very uh, strong and very expensive type of composite, carbon-carbon composites, and they can retain their elasticity, elast mod high modulus of elasticity and tensile strength up to 2000 degrees C. Very good creep resistance, high fracture toughness, low thermal expansion, high thermal conductivity, high thermal shock resistance so these carbon carbon composites are used in space shuttle 
nose tip and leading edges, rocket nozzles and tips, aircraft, F1 racing cars and train brakes. So this is a very expensive material and we are seeing here how it is made and those fibers can be aligned or they can be random in 3D and if they are aligned remember it's gonna be uh, an isotropic okay so there is the influence of the fiber length so there has to be a critical fiber length necessary for effective strengthening and stiffening to happen remember the fibers need to carry the stresses and if you want to effectively the matrix to transfer stresses to the fiber the fiber has to be at a certain length otherwise you cannot achieve effective strengthening or stiffening and critical fiber length depends on the tensile strength of the fiber and then fiber diameter and the shear strength of the fiber matrix interface there, that's the reason why we said that the bonding between the fiber and the matrix should be strong in order to achieve a uh, good uh, transfer of the stresses in order to achieve effective strengthening okay so uh, this fiber length uh, will of course given the it depends on the tensile strength and in interface strength etc it will change from uh, different fibers to different fibers for example for fiberglass common fiber length is above 15 millimeter to achieve this effective strengthening okay. so for long fibers stress transfer from matrix matrix is more efficient uh, as we go above the, uh, and if, if as we reach and go above the critical uh, the critical fiber length we are achieving uh, better strengthening more efficient strengthening okay so the idea here is let's say the capacity of the fiber is to carry um, six gigapascal let's say I'm making up okay so you want this whole stress to transfer uh, to the matrix so it is so it can use its full potential up to six gigapascal for example okay so for short and thick fibers uh, you are seeing the critical fiber length is below um, the, the fiber length itself I'm sorry the fiber length itself is below the critical fiber length right so L is when it's smaller than critical fiber length you have low fiber efficiency meaning you are not using the full potential of the fiber you are not transferring all stresses efficiently to the fiber so length really is important okay but uh, there is this in this figure the stress distribution around the fibers are given to us so in other words we can uh, show it in a graph okay so in the y-axis we can have stress and in the x-axis it is the position zero from zero position of the fiber to it, if it's length L up to size L okay in the x-axis so if you have fibers where L is lower than the critical uh, fiber length and the stresses distribution the fiber experiences looks like this so it means that the maximum stresses are experienced in the middle actually and at the edges it is lower 
so but your fiber strength is right there okay so you are not actually achieving an efficient transfer of stress you are not achieve using the full potential of the fiber uh, itself fiber can handle more stresses but this is the maximum it is handling right now it can handle more so you should efficiently transfer uh, the stress uh, but if this so so other way around is also possible when you have fibers that are that fiber size is bigger than the critical fiber size then you actually reach its maximum potential and all fibers now handling stresses at their potential at their uh, fracture strength failure strength okay so this is the case in here where l is bigger than LC it's a continuous long fibers okay so the key here is in summary that there has to be a critical fiber length for a certain system fiber system uh, where it you are able to efficiently achieve strengthening and stiffening okay because this and also this critical fiber length depends on the fiber strength and then uh, diameter and then the shear yield strength of the matrix I mean the interface between the fiber and the matrix so how do we determine the uh, again the modulus or properties strength and modulus of uh, fiber reinforced Mm, composites and the same idea here that we have applied to particle composites is valid which was the use of um, mix mean rule of mixture to equations to identify uh, the extremes so max and min values of stresses and moduluses that can that the composite can get So when stress is applied parallel to the direction of fibers, which means longitudinal loading, okay, so you have fibers like this and stress is applied parallel to that, longitudinal uh, direction, so the deformation of both matrix and fibers is the same when this is the case. We call it isostrain state isostrain state means longitudinal modulus so isostrain means that the uh, deformation of the matrix strain of the matrix and the fibers are the same and is equal to the overall deformation of the composite and when when this is the case equations can be derived and we're not going to go into the derivation but uh, again, uh, using the rule of mixtures, we can able to identify the strength of the composite and um, um, modulus of the composite in longitudinal uh, direction. So the L C means the composite, L means the longitudinal. And you see it depends on the volume fractions again, right? Volume fraction of the matrices and volume fraction of the fibers in this case. So in transverse loading, that means in this transverse direction, if we load, how can we calculate uh, the modulus or stress? So in the load is applied at a 90 degree angle to the direction of fiber alignment. In this case, stresses, not strains, in two components are equal. You see uh, how it is expressed, okay? In that case, uh, with this knowledge that the composition deformation also depends on the volume fractions, based on these equations, um, uh, equations for the uh, modulus can be derived 
again I'm not going to the uh, derivations but here you can see the final version of the how we calculate actually the modulus of the composite and this is the same equation written in a different version it's the same thing basically okay so there are other equations have been derived for example what if the fibers are discontinuous how we can estimate the stiffness or the Young's modulus when this is the case and these equations are we gonna learn of valid only 15 times of the critical fiber length equation and so in this case elastic modulus how we calculate in the fiber direction here you see the same equation here we are using but it now includes an efficiency factor and uh, if it's aligned an efficiency factor k if aligned this efficiency factor k is one if not aligned basically perpendicular efficiency factor zero that makes no effect of fiber in the modulus right because if you put zero to k that makes this term zero therefore the effect of fiber uh, there is no effect pretty much right so that is how alignment is important random arrangement in 2d and 3d uh, you achieve different isotropy and it the k factor just changes and depending on that you can calculate what is the uh, modulus of the composite There are further equations uh, to calculate the strength of the composites if you have discontinuous fibers. And it also depends on which equation you're going to use, depends on if you have lengths bigger than critical length, uh, critical uh, fiber length or smaller than critical fiber length. So based on that you see different equations are given to us which are basically much the developed experimentally that gives us uh, what type of stress levels we expect um, expect from a composite if it does have con discontinuous fibers now finally we're gonna take a look at uh, composite production methods so how the compo how do we produce composites so one example is poltrusion here we have continuous fibers uh, this is an example of a polymer matrix okay polymer matrix uh, fiber reinforced polymer matrix composites here the continuous fibers are pulled through a resin tank to impregnate fibers with thermosetting resins so first the fibers are coated with the resin okay and this is thermoset thermoset remember mm, thermosets are the ones where you have um, covalent bonding between the chains like that okay so but before this check uh, covalent bonds between the chains form uh, first you impregnate the fibers with the resin you are not doing the curing curing means uh, that you are actually forming these uh, inter intermolecular or the uh, bondings covalent bondings in between the chains you are you are forming it at this stage okay you don't want to form it initially because then you cannot uh, they are not uh, it is you know it is not it doesn't have a viscosity it is pretty hard material if that does happen so so first you impregnate uh, the fibers then it goes through um, preforming dyes to uh, preform to the desired shape after the preformed stock passes through a curing dye the, it goes to pullers where uh, it is machined to into a final shape and at the same time heated in to initiate the curing here uh, of the resin matrix matrix
Then there is filament winding, and this is used, for example, in the formation of vaulting poles, the construction of vaulting poles. See, here you have a continuous reinforcing fibers, like here. Okay, and then what is happening here is uh, they are po uh, the fibers are positioned in a predetermined pattern to follow a hollow shape. So the filament winding technique is to make hollow shape composites. Fibers are first uh, went through a resin bath to impregnate again with thermosetting resin. So this is how they introduced the matrix, okay? They coat the fibers with the resin first. And then these impregnated fibers uh, then continuously wound onto the mandrel. You are seeing the mandrel different type. Okay, I mean the mandrel is a uh, different type of uh, winding is happening, helical or circumferential or polar. So after appropriate, appropriate number of layers are added, curing is carried out either in an oven or at room temperature. Then the mandrel is removed which will give you the final product. And I suggest you guys you can watch the videos I'm sending you to if you're interested in how this process looks like. So structural ones are laminates and sandwich panels. So you are seeing uh, different sheets of fiber reinforced composites in which each of these fibers are aligned in a different uh, direction. We call it it's changing from 0 degree to 90 degree um, alignment. Okay. So here in individual uh, sheets here you achieve only strengthening in one direction but if you stack different layers with that the fibers align in different directions then you have can achieve stiffness in all directions right this is the idea of the laminates you stack them together stack the sheets and sandwich panels you see this is like a honeycomb structure usually a honeycomb core between two facing sheets this will have a low density and large bending stiffness. As you see that the shaping, giving the material different shapes, even that, can change the stiffness of the materials. So playing with the different wide range of uh, materials and also changing the shape or putting together different shapes of layers, also changing um, the properties and it depends on actually what type of properties you desire and in this case uh, with the honeycomb structure which is usually uh, desired to be used in aerospace industry it has low density but high large bending stiffness so if we want to summarize what are the benefits of composites if you have a ceramic matrix composite, you are increasing the toughness. Okay, so you are in, uh, measuring properties somewhere in between. Uh, you between the particle. So. So let's say you have particle reinforced ceramic, and you have. Um, fiber reinforced ceramic and you have unreinforced ceramic uh, you see it fractures right right there at low forces at low stress levels but putting a fiber it, it gives it some plastic deformation some uh, higher strength values so it is actually you see increasing the ductility because it breaks right there but this breaks right there so it is increasing the ductility and toughness toughness the area under the stress strain curve and then what about the polymer matrix composites so the idea here is polymers are not strong the whole idea is Polymers are lightweight, but they are not strong. So if I put some certain uh, um, fibers or reinforcements, I can get something that is low weight and increased stiffness and strength. 
In other words, I can increase specific stiffness, which is the modulus over density. I can increase that, or specific strength. Okay? And as you are seeing that the density of polymers are low here compared to other metals, metals and ceramics, materials, and that is the whole idea is to basically enhance their keep that density but then enhance their uh, modulus level by just making them into composite form and metal matrix composites the idea here is to increase the creep resistance of metals so you see for a certain strength volume, let me get the blue. For you see that when you have a matrix, when you have a metal matrix composite, its creep rate is uh, smaller compared to the one that is just pure aluminum alloy without any silicon carbide whiskers in it. In summary, we have learned you can have different types of composites. It depends on what type of matrix material you have. It can have ceramic matrix, metal matrix, polymer matrix. Reinforcement can be particles, fibers, structural and for different composites goals are different in metal matrix you want to achieve better uh, creep performance in ceramic matrix composites you want to enhance the fracture toughness of ceramics and in polymer matrix composites you want to increase specific strength and specific modulus and there are particularly enforced and these are large particle and dispersion strengthen and the properties are isotropic meaning you achieve strengthening at all directions the same way but when you have fiber reinforced it can be continuous and aligned or discontinuous aligned or discontinuous random and depending if it's random you have isotropic material but if they are aligned in a certain direction that gives you an isotropic properties in all so the direct in all directions the properties will be different Structural are laminates and sandwich panels. So this is the end of composites. Thank you.